All right, if you uh, have a watch, take a quick look at the time for me. About uh, three weeks ago, I was participating in what I can only imagine is every person's uh, favorite activity who's my age in college and on a Friday. I was interviewing, actually just down the hill, and the interview was actually going pretty smoothly, uh, as smoothly as anything goes for me at 8.30 in the morning, until the interviewer asked me his final question, and he said, John, I want you to tell me something that you firmly believe that you think other people don't ever consider. So I thought for a second, and I told him, I said, stories always make conversation better. This is the point that I'm hoping to convince you all of this morning, that in telling a story, you can inevitably make a conversation good. Naturally, the interviewer was pretty stunned. He said, can you explain your thinking? And I said, absolutely. A story is important for four reasons. The first is that it's captivating, and it's very entertaining. The second is that it is relatable. The third is that it plays with our emotions. And the fourth is that it is fundamental to the human nature. When we hear a story, we become very captivated and swept up in what is being said. We like to imagine that we're there. It is something that, that we've always enjoyed doing. Very quickly, raise your hand if you've taken a neuropsychology class here. Okay, not many. The reason I mention that is because I tend to think of stories as the playground for the mind. They, as I mentioned, are things that we like to do. When you're presented with a list of facts, a person's brain, there's, a, there, there's an area in, the, in a person's brain called the Broca's area. It's located right here behind your eyes in the front of your head, and it is the language processing and meaning part of the brain. It obviously is very active. But if those same facts were to be presented to you through a story, something very mysterious happens. The experiencing parts of your brains also become active. And when I say active, I don't mean like sort of active, I mean like very active. So for example, if I were to measure your brain activity, as I told you the following short story. This morning I walked across campus in the cold, dry air. What I would see is that your motor and your sensory cortices would light up like Times Square on New Year's Eve your brain chemistry would be clinically indistinguishable from actually walking across campus with me. By telling you a story, I've brought you into what I'm saying. I've sort of thrust you into the conversation. It's very enjoyable for, for both people. So obviously stories are captivating, but they're also relatable. Stories are how a listener can peek inside the consciousness of the storyteller. Another example might be, I tell you about the time that my heart was racing and my mind was wandering and my palms were sweating before I got up in front of a group of my peers to participate in my school's public speaking competition. And you might be able to say, wait a second, me too. He and I were more alike. There's a shared common struggle that I didn't put my finger on before, but now I can relate. And that's what stories do. They allow us to connect across the barriers of time and experience the shared similarities between one another that are both real and imagined. And this is important because if you think about this in the context of social psychology, one of the implications is that when we enjoy being with people, we form a connection with them. And this is really deep and meaningful. If you think about the implication of connecting with someone. There obviously is this sort of like emotional kernel that takes root. And really, emotions are sort of foundational to a story. A narrative that doesn't include an emotion is just a presentation of facts, and that takes us back to square one. So really, it's actually beneficial that a narrative or a story necessarily includes emotions, because otherwise, it would be, it would be boring. Now, if if you think about what this means, we can put it into the context of how a story actually operates. It's very patternized, it's very routine, the information is, is nicely structured, and it's all interrelated. This is something that Stanford Graduate School of Business professor Jennifer Aker comments when she cites her own internal data that says, when a person is uh, given information, when they're presented information through a story, they end up remembering it up to 22 times better than when it's just presented in data alone. And now, you can think of this, you can rationalize this uh, in, in two ways that I find to be complementary of each other. The first is, as I said, stories are patternized. The second goes back to the central theme of creating a bond. 
In 2013, there was a study published by a neuroscientist by the name of Paul Zak in Science Magazine in which he comments that when we listen to stories, a neuropeptide in our brain called oxytocin is released. And oxytocin is the feel-good drug. It is the same chemical that's released in our brains during sex, after childbirth, and in almost all of the other activities that include bonding as, an integ as being integrally important. And so I think it's only fitting with my, my mother and my sister sitting here that I make a joke that the three best things ever given to human society was the ability to have sex, the ability to have children, and the ability to tell a story, perhaps even in that order. <laughs> now, finally, uh, a story is very fundamental to what it means to be humans. Think about how we passed along all of our information for much of history. It was through a story. Consider cave drawings, for example, the very primal instinct to narrate and share our experiences. Stories, really, throughout our existence, were the, way, the method in which we transported history. It was how we shared our values and we passed along our skills. Storytelling has both a survival and an entertainment value. It's like the opposable thumb. It's just another structure that allowed our ancestors for much of their existence to reproduce and to survive. But ironically, and perhaps amazingly, stories became so important and so inherent in the human existence that they often become overlooked now. We want them, but we just don't know it. So in closing, I want to leave you with this. If a story is executed well, I promise it won't seem out of place. And in fact, it's very likely that the person you're talking to wants to hear a story. About six or seven years ago, I was sitting in my grandparents' house back in Atlanta, Georgia, with my cousins that had flown in from New York City. And it was after dinner, and we were sitting on the couch, and the youngest cousin looked up to me, and he was about four years old at the time, and he said, John, do you have any stories? And I said something along the lines of, well, yeah, but they're probably not terribly good. I was only 15 at the time. And his response, I think, is very emblematic of, of, of this innate desire to have a narrative weaved into a conversation. He said, well, I don't care if it's good. I just want to hear one. And I think whether you're four or whether you're 104, it's just human desire to want to hear a story. Stories are natural and they're compelling, they are emotive and they are communal. Stories, above all, could be the method that you lead someone to believe that perhaps you're a very persuasive public speaker before they ever come to realize that you've taken up seven minutes of their precious time. If you don't believe me, take a look back at your watch again. So in closing, I'd like to leave you with this. Tell a story in your next conversation. I promise you, you won't regret it, and neither will the person that you're talking to. Thank you.